Okay, um, good evening everybody. Thanks for coming along to this tonight. I know it's quite a strange time to come and hear someone talk about uh, animals, or animals that we don't know. Um, so my name is Ross Piper. I'm a zoologist and an entomologist. Um, and my main interests uh, are insects, so smaller animals mainly. Um, that's me there in front of a light trap in, uh, in Burma, in northern Burma, looking for new species of insects as part of a BBC expedition we did a few years ago. Um, so as, a, as an entomologist, you get to go to some really cool places, lots of places in the tropics looking for new species. Um, but my, my talk really tonight is about why we know so little about life on Earth, because um, so far we've described about 1.5 million animal species, but there are millions more out there still to describe, so still to discover and, and under, understand. Um, but first off, though, um, is that moving? Not yet. Not yet. Wait a minute. Oh, there we go. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of this picture. This is a picture of uh, Pluto that was taken about six years ago now by the New Horizons spacecraft. Um, and I just wanted to show this because this is, you know, it's, it's a beautiful picture. But the thing is, you can all, almost be guaranteed there's nothing living on this planet out in the depths of space. This is a cold, dead world. And you contrast that with this picture of, of our planet Earth. And now, the sad thing is that we know way more about the surfaces of, of planets deep out in space than we do about our own planet. And that, to me, is really crazy. We spend billions of, of dollars every year doing all sorts of things in space, and we know next to nothing, and we're not, I'm not exaggerating, we know next to nothing about planet Earth, about how many species there are, about how all those species live, and about how they all interact. And that's something that, really, um, that, that I'm really passionate about, trying to show people that there's still so much to discover on planet Earth. Um, I want to do a little test, so I want to do a little experiment before I continue any more. If you can, uh, can you all stand up for me? There's not many of you, but it will be enough. Okay. And I want you to think of an animal. So any animal that pops into your head, keep it there, keep the image there. Okay. And then if you're thinking of a mammal, so anything with fur, like so whether it's a cat, dog, a whale, elephant, a rhinoceros, whatever, sit down if you're thinking of a mammal. Um, if you're thinking of a bird, any type of bird, so something with feathers, sit down. If you're thinking of some sort of reptile, so, you know, whether it's a lizard, snake, anything with scales, sit down. Um, and anything like whether it's a frog, toad, uh, a newt, anything like that. Okay, we've got a few left. What were you thinking of? A fruit fly. A fruit fly. Okay, very good. What about you? Uh, Centipede, brilliant. What about you three over there? Tarantula. Tarantula. What about you two? A what? Lion. Lion. Mammal, sit down. <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, it's very good. So, yeah, the rest of you can sit down. All I was trying to demonstrate there is that when we think of an animal, we think of the ones that are um, vertebrates. So often mammals, because they're very similar to us. We're a mammal. Um, but in actual fact, the animal, animals are superbly diverse. So amongst the animals, the animals can be diver di divided into about 35 major groups. Um, the vertebrates are only... One of these up there illustrated by the naked man. In addition to that, you have 34 of these different types of animal groups, many of which contain many, many more species than the vertebrates. So, for example, the arthropods, things like insects and spiders and, ara uh, and arachnids, um, that's supremely diverse. You can see that in this next slide here. Um, oh, wait a minute. I've... Yeah, this image here. This shows you the relative proportion of each of those groups. So you can see that the arthropods, so the insects, the spiders, and the crustaceans, that's way bigger in terms of species than all the other groups combined. So far, we've described around um, 1.25 million species of arthropod, but there's millions more out there. Even for things like vertebrates, there, where we've got about 65,000 described species, there are still loads more to describe, especially things like fish, uh, um, marine fish and also freshwater fish in places like the Amazon. There's still an enormous amount to understand. So, 
Why is this then? Why do we know so little about life on Earth, specifically what interests me are the animals? Why do we know so little about them? Um, and the fact, one of the first main reasons is the Earth is big. We tend to forget how big the Earth is because we can travel so easily now from continent to continent on a plane. It takes us a couple of hours. And we just forget how massive the Earth is. Um, in terms of the oceans alone, when people say, you know, we've, we've described or we've explored around 5% of the oceans, they're referring to the seabed. You know, you have to remember the whole water column, so the whole depth of the oceans is a habitat that's inhabited by all sorts of weird and wonderful species. Um, and that habitat by volume is way bigger than all the other habitats when you think of what's on land. Um, and then also, when we try and represent the Earth, normally it's with this Mercator projection, so you're trying to fit a 3D globe into a 2D space. And so all the land masses in the middle here, so Africa in particular, get squashed. So when you see this Mercator projection, you'll see that Greenland up at the top there looks the same sort of size as, as Africa. But in actual fact, Africa is 15 times bigger than Greenland. You know, these are enormous land masses, like Africa itself, 30 million square kilometers. These are enormous places. When you think of all the places where animals can be in those places, mountains, rivers, lakes, there's an enormous amount of places where people haven't really explored at all. Um, these are just some of the bigger animals, so my main interest are the smaller animals, insects and things, but even amongst the bigger animals, bigger animals are being discovered every year. So in the last few years, there's been new mammals discovered in South America there, the Olinguito, new reptiles in the um, Atlantic forest of Brazil. The, the, the forests of Central Africa, hardly anyone's been there really. Um, I mean, there's a, lot of, there's, there's a few groups there studying mammals, some of the bigger animals, but hardly anyone's studying the smaller stuff. And then up into southern Sudan as well there with the panda bat, you can see the top there. Um, southern Sudan, again, hardly anyone's really been there. And then down into obviously places like, one of my main interests is Burma, so up there where you had a new species of deer discovered not too long ago. And then Papua New Guinea. In Madagascar, there's a huge number of places all around the world where you can go and you can find uh, undescribed species relatively easily. But you can do this in Europe too. You know, this isn't just limited to the tropics. You can do this anywhere, um, especially amongst in insects and smaller animals. Um, so northern, nor so me and Master Burma is, is of interest to me as I've been there on expeditions. Um, so I've been as far north as, as Tamanthi, you can see there. But if you go venture even further north, that's called the, uh, the Northern Forest Complex, which is mostly unexplored, really. A few people have been there to try and climb some of the big mountains, but in terms of um, trying to document the, the animals and plants there, very, very few people have been there, because it's so difficult to get to these places. We, we tend to forget, we live in Europe where there's lots of infrastructure, lots of roads and railways, and you can fly different places. But most of these places in the tropics and the subtropics, it's so difficult to get anywhere. Um, like even to get to this place, Tamanthi, here, that was a massive endeavor to try and get there with a group of people. Um, and this is like some of the habitats in these northern parts of Burma, these fantastic steep-sided valleys clothed in uh, primary forest. Uh, and again, there's all sorts of biological riches to discover in these mountains. Um, these are some of the alpine pastures. So this is up, up beyond sort of 3,500 meters, 4,000 meters, where you've got habitats like this. And I can guarantee, if I was there looking for insects in that habitat, most of, most of the things that I'd find would be um, new species. Uh, and then enormous mountains. This is uh, Kakabarazi Mountain, so in that national park in the topmost part of Burma. This has only ever been climbed by one person uh, in 1996. Like, even getting to the, the base of that mountain is a massive deal. Like, to get there, you have to walk about 140 miles through uh, jungle. And then you get to the bottom, and you have to try and climb that mountain, which is around 6,000 meters high. And no one's even accurately measured it, because no one's taken um, a calibrated GPS to the top of it to measure this thing. Um, and there's lots of places like this. You know, Burma isn't the only place like this. There are countless places all around the world where you can go and do some really exciting stuff. Um, you can watch a little film, actually, on National Geographic um, with an American uh, team who tried to climb that about seven years ago. They failed, 
because it's just so difficult. That's why one person's only ever done it. Um, so beyond the fact the earth is massive, most animals are small. Most animals are much smaller than us. So unless we're specifically looking for them, we simply, simply don't notice them. And this is nicely illustrated by the, the constellation of sub one millimeter animals. So animals that are less than one millimeter long. So smaller than a lot of uh, single-celled organisms that live on and in between the sediment grains on the seabed. Now, in one handful of this habitat, you can find representatives of more animal lineages than you can find in an entire tropical rainforest. But again, hardly anyone studying this sort of habitat, even though there's in incredible complexity, but in a tiny, tiny space. So these are animals. You know, these are all animals, complex beings, composed of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of cells, just on a very miniaturized scale. Um, and then again, um, this is um, a type of insect. I found this one in my garden. This is the type of thing called a fairy wasp. So this thing is 0.8 millimeters long, okay? So less than one millimeter long. And in that body, you've got all the same organ systems as, as your eyes. So there's a um, central nervous system, there's a gut, there's reproductive organs, there's the equivalent of uh, kidneys, the equivalent of a liver, um, and a way of getting oxygen and carbon dioxide in and out of the body. In that tiny space, 0.8 millimeters. And that's it there next to a 1p coin. I should have probably put that next to a 1 euro coin for reference, yeah? Um, but that shows you how small it is. This is just about on the sort of cusp of what I can see with my na naked eye these days. Um, but they get even smaller. That's not even the smallest one. They get much smaller. This is the smallest one that's known so far. This is 0.14 millimeters. So you've got this extreme miniaturization where you've got this in enormous complexity, but in a tiny, tiny space. This is an animal, but it's much smaller than lots of single-celled organisms. And animals have done that again and again, especially insects, with this extreme miniaturization. So packing enormous complexity into a tiny, tiny space. Um, these are some photos I took in Peru of a, of a similar thing. Again, this shows you how small some of these things can be. This wasp here is probably, again, probably about 0.8 millimeters long, and it lays its eggs inside the eggs of other insects. So the places where these things develop are these tiny little spheres, the eggs here, and you can see lots of individuals all developing in the egg of one shield bug. This whole um, little clutch of eggs was decimated by this parasitoid wasp. These parasitoid wasps are probably the most diverse insects of all. Any species of insect you're aware of or any species of spider has at least one parasitoid wasp that attacks that one species alone, sometimes more than one species for each life stage of the insect or the spider. So one for the, the, the eggs, one for the larvae, one for the pupae or whatever. So massively complex. Um, and then this thing here, this again shows you complexity on a very small scale. This is another animal that I collected in, in Peru. This is a thing called a pseudoscorpion. Um, and this is a little video now that shows you the internal complexity. So we image the inside of this body using a special, very high-powered light called an, um, an X-ray synchrotron. So that produces an extremely strong beam of light so you can see inside something. A live, uh, well, a, a dead specimen. Hopefully the video will play. Um, there we go. So this is like showing you the insides of it. So you see all the muscle fibers there, the brain, the gut the reproductive organs, then it comes in from the other side. But you can see that enormous, this animal is only about three millimeters long. Yeah, in that space, you've got this incredible complexity. These are venomous too, by the way, so these, uh, these incapacitate their prey with the venom that's produced in the big pedipalps there. But again, in that tiny space, think about that, three millimeters. So think about how big three millimeters it is, and inside that tiny space, you've got all this complexity. Um, we're also, apart from, so there's lots of small animals out there. Most animals are small, much smaller than us. Um, and we're also drawn to similar animals because of the way they look or the way they behave. And typically, as I showed at the start, these are mammals. When we tend to think of animals, we think of mammals. Um, but many animals are very alien to us in terms of the way they look and the way they behave. There are lots of animals out there that don't have a head, lots more that don't have a face of any description. Uh, I mean, it's much easier to identify with a lioness and the challenges that she faces nurturing her cubs on the plains of Africa than it is to form any sort of emotional bond with a faceless crustacean that spends most of its life attached to the eye of a fish. 
So this thing here, the copepod, parasitic organism that lives most of its life attached to the eye of the fish, the host. Now, how, how bizarre does that seem to us? So when we think of animals, we tend to forget all these really bizarre, well, most of us don't know about these really bizarre life histories, but these, these are animals too, you know, they're closely related to us, ultimately. Um, and appearances can also be deceiving. So the way that something looks, uh, just the outward appearances of an animal, completely can completely confound our attempts to figure out what's what and to try and describe new species. Um, and this, in part, is linked to the popular preconception of what evolution is and how evolution works. So to most people, evolution is this one-way linear process where simple forms give rise to progressively more complex forms. Okay, that's what, it, that's what evolution is in most people's heads, okay? Um, but in actual fact, in adapting to a particular way of life, an animal can lose some, if not all, of the complexities of its ancestors. And so this, uh, this process is known as secondary simplification or degeneration, and it's extremely common in the animals. Um, so where we see something that looks simple, in actual fact, it's not. It's just lost a lot of the complexities of its ancestors. Uh, this is a really nice example of this. Now, you might assume that this is something that's been coughed up by another animal, but this is actually a type of crustacean. Um, it's actually specifically um, a crustacean called a copepod. And at the bottom right here is what a copepod normally looks like. But this one, though, in adapting to a parasitic way of life, has lost nearly all of the complexities of its ancestors. So there are no appendages, no obvious sense organs, and it's become little more really than a bag for feeding and reproducing. So as a juvenile, this animal tunnels in through the skin of a fish, and it stimulates the tissues of the fish to produce a cyst-like bag in which it lives. Okay? But what's most amazing of all is what happens to the male. The male is that thing there at the top. Okay, that's the male, Sarcotaces. He more, he's almost been reduced out of existence because all he's there is to produce sperm, okay? Um, so whenever you're feeling really sorry for yourself, just spare a thought for this little chap because he spends nearly his entire life pressed up against the inside of that cyst-like structure by the relatively enormous blob-like female, so this thing here. Um, but again, you know, there's a huge number of things out there still like this, living these weird and wonderful lives that are still to discover and describe and understand. Um, and again, along the same theme of appearances can be deceiving, um, can anyone hazard a guess as to what this is? Shout it out if you think you know what it is. Who said wasp? Fatima. So yeah, it looks like a wasp, but it's actually a moth. It's actually a moth that's pretending to be a wasp. Uh, this is one, a new species that I found in Burma. Um, but the subtlety of the mimicry was incredible, not only in terms of the way it looks, but also the way it behaves, the way it flies, is very wasp-like. And so I did like a sort of triple take until I realized it was actually a fantastic little uh, moth. And again, this type of mimicry, uh, these, where one thing is pretending to look like something else, is extremely common, especially amongst the insects. Um, this is another type of mimic. So you're probably thinking that this is the head end here where this sort of black eye is, okay? But that's the, that's the back end of the insect. The head is actually here. So this thing is pretending to be um, uh, an insect called a weevil. I don't know what you call them in Portuguese, like with a long, uh, long snout. Uh, exactly why it's doing that, no one knows. Because with all these things I've showed you so far, we might have described the species and given it a name, but in terms of how it lives, we know next to nothing about most of the things on the planet, animal-wise. Um, and then this is another important reason, cryptic diversity. This is where what we assume to be one species is actually a complex of lots of superficially identical species, all of which have very distinct lives, though. So it's only when you look at their DNA and you look at the way they live, so their ecology, you find that actually one species is actually many. And a nice example here is this tiny little wasp again from Costa Rica. Now, this was once assumed to be one species, but when people look at it, uh, people looked at its ecology, so the way it lives, and they sequenced its DNA, they found out it's actually 36 cryptic species, all of which look the same, but all of which do different things in their environment. And this cryptic diversity in smaller animals especially 
Not just small animals, too. They recently found that giraffes are probably five different species, cryptic species. Um, this is extremely common. So when you see the, the, uh, the estimates of like, species diversity for animals around the globe, you can probably increase all, of their num all those numbers by at least 10 because of things like this, because of cryptic diversity. Um, and then, so, yeah, we touched on some of the other reasons. And then, um, yeah, collecting things and identification can be extremely difficult for some of the reasons I've already mentioned. Uh, but collecting in particular, because most species are, are rare. Um, these are the numbers of species of the main groups of insect that we've described so far. So for beetles, nearly 400,000 species are known around the world. Butterflies and moths, around 180,000 species. 150,000 species for wasps, ants, and bees. And then about 125,000 for, for flies. Um, it will probably turn out in the future that these two groups, so the wasps, the ants, and bees, and the flies are probably the biggest of all because they're so poorly known and there's so few people relatively working on them. But I think in the fullness of time, you can multiply all those numbers by at least 10 to get to the real numbers, how many species of these different insects there are out there. Just enormous number of species. Um, and then, as I said, collecting can be difficult, primarily because most species are rare. You know, we tend to assume that you know, these insects are everywhere, but what, that's confounded by the fact there's a few very, very common species, but most things are very rare. This is another thing I collected in Burma that turned out to be a new genus, a new genus of insect called a mantis fly. Um, but I could go back to the same place where I found this, and I could spend a month looking for that thing and never see it again. A lot of these things seem to be able to exist at really, really low population densities. Um, and for all I know, it probably spends most of its time up in the canopy. I found this one by chance and brought it back to the UK, and then it turned out to be a new genus. Um, as larvae, these have a really weird uh, development where they develop inside the, uh, the silk and egg sacs of spiders as parasites, parasitoids, I should say. Um, yeah, so again, really bizarre lifestyle for most of these things. And then these things too, this is a type of beetle called a buprested, this one from nor uh, northern Malaysia. Now, the adult is a fantastic thing, you know, it's about that big and all these fantastic colours. Um, a common name for this group of beetles is jewel beetles because of the colours. Um, and these things are, are fantastic. But when you find the adults, you forget that for most of its life, it's a larvae that lives in wood. And sometimes the larvae of these things can take 50 years to, re to develop. So the larval stage is 50 years long um, in suboptimal conditions where the conditions are not perfect. 50 years. But the adult might only live for three or four weeks. And so unless you're there at the right time, you're never going to see, you're never going to see these because you'll never, see, you'll never be there when the adults are emerging. And it's so difficult to find the larvae, you'll never know it was there. And that's the same for lots of insects, where the larvae live in these really cryptic places that are very difficult to study. Um, and then this is another one from Burma. This is a, a beautiful moth. Uh, called Calorimetes subornata. Um, this is one I, ha I found on the, uh, the light trap that was on my first picture with the big light sheet with the big light. Now, this thing's only been seen, that was the second time it's been seen. It was first described in 1894 in northern India. And the, the time I saw it in Burma, that's the second time anyone's ever seen it. So where are, where are these things hiding? Either, they, they're, either they're able to exist at very low, very, very low population densities, or they're spending all their time with the canopy in these subtropical forests. Uh, the, the canopy of these the tropical forests and subtropical forests is a real frontier because it's so difficult to get up there and not disturb the things. Um, it's one of the most difficult habitats to access. And so I think there, there are an enormous number of species in, in that one habitat alone still to discover. Um, oh, yeah, here we go. And then, so you've got obviously a lot of things that are rare, but some of, the, some of these animals live in such specialized niches that unless you're looking in that particular place, you're never going to see them. So this one here, this is a type of dung beetle. So it feeds on poo of other animals or mammals. Uh, but this one only feeds on the poo of monkeys. And that, so the adults spend most of their time attached to a monkey's bum like this. Okay. 
So there's not many entomologists out there that are like spending a lot of time looking at monkeys' asses. So there's so many niches in which, in which things can live. And unless you're looking at all those niches, you're never going to see lots of these things. And then this, another example of a parasitoid, but this one's really fascinating because of its complex life cycle. Um, I've only ever seen, uh, in the whole time I've been interested in insects and been looking for insects, you know, more than 20 years, I've only ever seen two of these. So one in Peru um, and one in the UK. Um, this thing is really weird because of the way it lives. So this is a female. And she uses her abdomen here to leave her eggs on the surfaces of leaves in the hope that those eggs get eaten by a caterpillar. Now, if the eggs are eaten by a caterpillar, the eggs are swallowed, and the larvae of this thing tunnels out of the caterpillar's gut into its body cavity. Um, if that was the end of the story, that would be quite commonplace. Lots of parasitoids live that way. But what really sets this one apart is that when those larvae hatch inside the body of the host, they're looking for other parasitoids, so other insects that have already infected that caterpillar. So for this thing to complete its life cycle, not only must its, its eggs be eaten by the right sort of caterpillar, that caterpillar must already be infected by the right sort of parasitoids. And so the fact that there are so many things that can go wrong at any step in that, in that developmental pathway, that these things are very rare. You know, it's a, bit, it's a real lottery existence. The female might lay, you know, 10,000 eggs, but she's going to be really lucky if even two of those manage to complete their development and turn into adult wasps. Hence, why these things are really rare. Um, and as I, as I said, you know, before, um, so it's one thing being able to go out there and find new species, um, but even for the ones that we know and we've given a name to, the ones that have been described, we still know next to nothing about the ways they live. So there's very few species that, that have been studied in any detail. Fair enough, things like mosquitoes um, and lots of insects that affect us or like if they feed on their crops, they've been well studied. But the rest haven't been at all, yeah? This is a thing called the European bee wolf. Um, that you can find throughout Europe. This, these are some of my pictures from, from the UK. Now, there are 20,000 species of solitary wasp that live a similar existence to this, where they are specialist predators of a particular animal. This one only feeds on honeybees. So it provisions its nest with honeybees. It stings the bee to paralyze it, then carries it back to the nest, sometimes a kilometer or more, and buries it in a, buries it in a subterranean chamber. And that's what the larvae of the, the bee will feed on, the paralyzed honeybees. Um, so this is one of the few species of 20,000 known solitary wasp species where the ecology is well known. There's a chap in Germany who spent about 10, 15 years trying to figure out exactly what happens when these things are underground, and he's found out all these remarkable things about what happens. So they use all sorts of antibiotics that they, the females produce to protect the larvae when it's developing in the ground. Uh, and the way they protect and embalm the honeybees at the start. And also, another level of complexity, they've got their own parasitoids. This is one of their parasites, this thing here, this uh, cuckoo wasp, sometimes called jewel wasp because of their colors. Now, it's been found out that that animal there mimics the odor of the bee wolf. So it can get into the nest of a bee wolf, lay its own egg, which feeds on the, uh, the paralyzed honeybees, and it can do that undetected because it smells the same as a bee wolf. If it's detected underground, if it's found by a bee wolf, then it'll be killed. And so it's evolved to mimic the odor of the bee wolf. But it's taken this chap 10 or 15 years of intense study to figure out some of these things. And that's just one species of 20,000 species. So it just gives you an idea of how much there's still to discover out there. You know, there's so much. So anyone, any, you know, if you're just starting off, like if you're, you know, you're a high school student or you're going to university to study biology, there's so much to discover, and I think it makes it really exciting. Um, and there's few people looking for stuff. For most, of, for most of these groups, there's few people looking. So there's, so there's quite a few entomologists, so people like me around the world looking at insects, but there's some of these other animals. You could probably count the number of people on one hand who are studying these things. And things like nematode worms, these are, these are everywhere, in every habitat, from the depths of the deepest parts of the ocean all the way to the tops of the highest mountains, they are everywhere. Um, and extremely important ecologically. Uh, they're involved in producing soil, 
are involved in plant diseases, protecting certain plants from certain diseases. All sorts of incredibly important ecological roles. Um, and look at some of the numbers. So in one acre of farm soil, there can be anywhere between three and nine billion of these. Well, that's super diverse, super common. So far, we've described around 25,000 species of nematode, but there's probably a million species. They're just everywhere, and no one's really look, looking at them, even though they're so important ecologically. Um, these are some of the heads of a few nematode species, and guess where these live? These live only in the guts of certain giant millipedes in Africa, where they feed on other, other, other nematodes that feed on contents in the gut of the millipede. So in these tiny spaces, you've got these microcosms of life. You know, these things are only tiny, a couple of millimeters long. But in these tiny little microcosms, the body of a millipede, you've got all this. Almost like a tiny version of the savanna, the Serengeti or whatever. Just incredible complexity on a tiny scale. Um, but why does any of this matter, though? You're probably thinking, who cares? Who cares about all these species that are still to discover out there? Well, I think if we... I think in terms of applied science, I think... Um, we can only really understand all the natural systems that keep us alive and all the other life on Earth by understanding the component parts, and those component parts are all of the species that we share planet Earth with. Um, but then evolution is also the greatest problem solver. And so by studying evolution, we'll find solutions to many of the problems facing humanity. Um, like this one here, so it was by studying jellyfish that people found a thing called uh, a type of protein that fluoresces. So the green fluorescent protein. And that GFP has completely revolutionized our understanding of cell and molecular biology. And it was just by some chaps who were quite interested in looking at jellyfish uh, about 40 years ago. Um, this example here, does anyone know what this is, by the way? Anyone hazard a guess at it? No? This is a cone snail. So these are uh, venomous predatory snails that live in the sea. Some of them are acutely venomous. If you got um, stung by one of these, it can kill you in like three minutes. They're extremely, extremely venomous. Um, but by studying the venom of this animal, a compound was found um, that's been developed into a, a painkiller that's about 10,000 times more effective than morphine. It's been developed by a company in Japan. Just one of the compounds in, in the venom produced by this. The venom of this animal probably contains more than 100 different compounds all of which have these different functions. Only a few have been studied so far. What about this animal? Um, do you know what this is? Anyone know what this is? Tardigrade. Uh, we, water bears, tardigrade. Um, so these are tiny. Again, these are sub one millimeter, so much, much, much smaller than one millimeter generally. Um, and they can effectively time travel from one period of favorable conditions to the next by entering a, a state of suspended animation. And they do that by replacing all the water molecules in their body with a simple sugar called trihalos. So they effectively, they effectively crystallize themselves. And the process in which they do this um, has inspired a new type of glass that promises to uh, further improve the uh, efficiency of LED lights and things like that. But it's only by people who have an interest and a fascination with wanting to understand the lives of these things that all these other things come tumbling out that will be of use to us. Um, but I think, you know, more intrinsically though, you know, we have to remember that there's all these species on Earth, and as humans, as intelligent and curious beings, I think it's our duty to protect and to understand all these other weird and wonderful species, not least of all for their own sake, but also because of what they teach us about the phenomenon of life. Um, and I think we have to remember that we're extremely privileged to live on this beautiful planet that's absolutely teeming with life. Um, and I think, you know, that's really what we have to cherish above all else. So thank you very much. Cheers. <laughs> well, any, uh, any questions? Any questions? Yeah. Tell you, can you say mask down? Thanks. Oh, there's a microphone. There's a microphone. Sorry. Wait a second. All right. I would like to know what's the feeling to find something that no one ever seen like before. Like um, when you go on your expeditions. Or how I do it. No, how you feel when you... When oh, amazing. Like, I mean, if it's something, you know, 
Because with, with a few of those things that I've showed you today, you know straight away that it's something really interesting. Um, and I feel, like, I feel like I did when I was about four years old, when I used to find things in the garden, and I didn't know what they were, but I was fascinated by them. So I still have that, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's an amazing feeling. But I think more so being in those places, in the first, you know, being in those places itself, and just, you know, I, I can never convey here, you know, the smells and the sounds. It's actually going there, I think, you know, that it, it's an incredible experience. But yeah, finding new stuff, yeah, it's an amazing thing. Yeah. Any other, yeah, any other questions? Uh, hi, thank you for the presentation before all. Thanks. Uh, I just want to know, what's, in your personal opinion, the most amazing creature you have studied or have learned about? What is the one that interested you the most? Um, the ones that really fascinate me the most are the ones that I showed you towards the beginning. You know, the parasitoid wasps? They live inside other, other insects normally, or spiders. I think because their, their lifestyles are so complex, their life cycles are so complicated, and you think about how they find their hosts, how they develop inside their hosts, um, and, there's just, and there's, so many to, there's so many out there still. They're easily the biggest group of animals by a long way, uh, those, those parasitoids. Thanks. Yeah, oh, uh, microphone's come in. Hi. Hello. Uh, how exactly do you know uh, when you, uh, how do you know if it's a new species when you see it? I mean, with, with a lot of things, if it's the, the example I showed there with that mantis fly, the one that lives in spider egg sacs, um, those are quite, you, you don't, you rarely see those. So there's a good chance if you're in somewhere that few people have been before, like in Burma, for example, there's a good chance if you find one of those, it's probably going to be new. With other things, um, it's a bit of a hunch. If it's things that are quite difficult to find, things that live in sort of cryptic habitats, there's a good chance it's probably new. Things like maybe butterflies, less so because so many people study butterflies. Um, but if you're studying more obscure groups, there's a good chance if you're collecting in remote places, a big proportion of what you find will be new. But for most things, you don't know straight away. We take it back to the museum. All the stuff I collect goes back to the Natural History Museum in London. Um, and then that's sent out to different specialists who are working on, sometimes on that particular genus of insects. You know, so there's extreme specialism. And often for some of these groups, there is no specialist. Uh, so they might, they might be waiting in a box for the next 50 or 60 years until someone can actually look at them, yeah? So yeah, often you don't. But sometimes if you look at the right groups, you can say there's a good chance that's probably new. Yeah. Is that, is that uh, an uh, answer? Uh, uh, yes, yes. I just wanted to ask you something else. Okay, yeah, go uh, for it, yeah. Is there, like, um, do you think there's a specific number of the amount of animals that exist on Earth? Or is uh, or that's always changing, like, every time? It's always changing. Because, you know, I was talking about species. That term species is so difficult to pin down. Uh -huh. You know, because as humans, we like to pigeonhole things. But I think nature's a lot fuzzier, really. And so I think it's sort of things, so over time, it's always changing, you know, because one species might become many, the species will go extinct of their own, but then also we're driving lots of species to extinction with all the habitat destruction we're doing. So yeah, it's always changing. But I think with, with the things that I mentioned tonight, insects in particular, there are millions and millions of species still to describe. You know, which I, you know, that's fascinating, you know. You can be, you know, if you're a kid now, you can still be an explorer and you go out and discover new things. That's so cool. Anyone else? Yes. Me, myself. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm a ceramist, and uh, seeing this, I was extremely provocated to produce new things by the colors and new patterns that you showed through insects. And I was just wondering if never cross your mind to look for a fundraising instead of a zoo of uh, extinct animals to <laughs> yeah, everything yeah. that is still to be provoked to discover by children. Yeah, I mean, you know, with some of these things, I think it's quite difficult to get people interested in things like insects and stuff because there's that, always that sort of yuck factor. But if you can show them pictures like this, if you can show them like, you know, real sort of like macro photos and show the beauty of these things and the colors, that can get past a lot of that, I think. Uh, because people, if you're just looking with your naked eye, you're probably never going to see the detail that I can show you with some of these 
macro pictures. Um, you can, you can to a certain extent with some of the bigger things that I showed you. Um, but that's why I think having good images, so in the books that I do, you know, I try and get the best images or take the best images that I can, because that's so important. Having good images is so important to try and show people the beauty and the wonder of all this stuff that we share the planet with. <laughs> Hello, uh, thank right. you for the lecture. Um, I'm almost ending my bachelor in biology, and this uh, question comes a bit uh, about what you just told. Uh, the world is so big, it's full of stuff, and uh, I would like to know if you could tell us a bit how was your, uh, like, uh, throughout your life, how was your course, so how did you define, like, okay, now I, did, I do this, then the next stage is this, because at this time in my life, I'm ending the course, but I still don't know, like, there's so many options. Yeah, know? no, you're right, you're right. But I think, you know, as, if you get exposed to as many things as possible and realize that, yeah, because I haven't taken a sort of traditional route, really. So I did my degree, uh, and then I did a PhD, and then I stayed in academia for a bit, but then I got out of academia and did some other things that, on balance, were probably okay in terms of teaching me other things, but then I ended up going back into sort of being associated with academia, but not working in a university. But that's given me a lot of freedom. You know, freedom. I don't think I'd have, like, the, the big book that I've written, Animal Earth, I don't think I'd have done that if I'd have stayed in academia. Uh, but nowadays, I think, I think there are lots more avenues you can explore, yeah? Because, I mean, I do all sorts of things. So I do expeditions, I do writing, some things on telly, some research. So we've got a few different things going on um, to enable me to earn money. You know, um, so it's not the sort of traditional where it's very sort of linear, like you go to, you, you do a PhD and you stay in a university for your whole life. I think there are lots of options open to us now, especially if you're interested in maybe, you know, sharing your enthusiasm with the stuff you're fascinated by. You know, you, there's all sorts of things you can do along those lines. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you can expose yourself to as many things as possible and try and like, you know, just see what other things that are potentially out there, apart from the normal sort of trajectory, yeah? Then I think, you know, I think it's trying to find your own sort of, your own, your own path, really, if that makes sense. <laughs> Whatever that is. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hello there. Yeah, well, thank you for the presentation. Okay. Um, I just wanted to... to uh, build up in uh, one of the questions from the audience. Um, when we have talked about uh, uh, the number of species that we know out of, uh, I don't know, a total, how do you estimate uh, the total number of uh, species that we don't know? Or, or life or just insects or animals? Uh, well, uh, I, I, think, I think insects are probably... I see, some in, I see some estimates like being banded around that says um, about 8 million species in total for everything. You know, but to me, that's complete rubbish. I think it's much, much, much higher. Um, so there, there, was a, there was a paper that came out a few years back by a chap in um, Arizona called Brendan Larson, where he tried to estimate everything. So he was looking at things like nematodes and mites, Again, another group that no one really looks at. Um, it look, he was looking at everything. And he, he, they estimated, this included bacteria too, but he was estimating uh, between three and six billion species. You know? And for arthropods alone, getting on for 30 million species. Um, I think you're more in that sort of ballpark with insects and things. It, it's it's got to be more than 10 million easily. Because you think of the tropics. Think of the tropics, and any time I go to the tropics, just the diversity is colossal. And I'm only seeing things that I can easily find. You know, all the things in the canopy that I'll never see, you know, that probably only live in like a small patch of forest even, like maybe over one hectare, who knows. And with every, you know, with every bit we, we cut down, those things are lost forever. You know, these things that are unique in the universe, not just on Earth. Guaranteed, there's no, if, if there's life elsewhere in the cosmos, there's nothing that's going to be exactly the same as a, as a chrysomelid that's living on a leaf in the canopy in the Amazon rainforest. So with every one we lose, you know, these things are unique. Uh, but I think, yeah, for insects alone, I, I think over 10 million, easily. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Was that vague enough? <laughs> Any other questions? I've exhausted all the questions. Ask me anything you want. I'm here for another, oh, no, no minutes. I've got to get off. Well, thanks very much for coming anyway. Thank you. I appreciate it. Cheers. Ross, Oeiras, 46 km quadrados de ideias e emoções com que damos forma ao futuro. Oeiras 27.